If you want to do a pop accompaniment style, that's where you would play the chords and someone would sing. So either your student would sing, uh, there's a man waiting in the sky, da 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 um, turning it into a sea shanty. So you can just play the chords. You don't need to worry about the melody. So that's a style that you can play, this kind of... Just right-hand chord, keeping a beat, left-hand bass line. It's Tim Topham here again and welcome to the TopCast where we love sharing business and pedagogy ideas to help you thrive in your music teaching studio. And today we're continuing on our five week journey through our Hesitant to Hero No Book Challenge. This is day four. And if you haven't listened to the first three days, then I really encourage you to go back and start with those. Is it essential? No, you can start with today, but it would be great to do those ones as well. How's it all been going? I hope you've been doing your homework as any good student slash teacher should. And we would love to find out how things have been going. So do feel free to share either in our forums if you're a Top Music Pro member or over on Facebook in our group or even on the show notes page for this episode. That's at topmusic.co slash episode 287. So we've already covered chord quick wins and lead sheets and repertoire remixing today. We're looking at something we call hook line and sinker. And don't forget that you can grab the download and handout for today at our show notes page. And also, quick reminder that next week, I'm going to be unlocking our exclusive discount for Top Music Pro membership. That's $19 for the first month. I cannot wait to share that with you. And that's coming up. And as usual, I'll come back after today's presentation with um, a little bit of homework to share with you, some examples to get you all inspired. So day four, what is this hook, line and sinker all about? Well, we're talking about teaching pop and classical hooks and riffs to your students. And we talk about how giving students modern pop hooks to play can build their identity as a musician. It's crucial in those preteen and young teenage years if your students are going to keep playing. We'll talk about a student versus teacher-led approach to teaching popular styles, how to keep current, some famous pop hooks and riffs, and it's super fun. Here's what Steph told us. Thank you to Tim and team for reassurance that this method of simplifying chords is a great thing to be doing. Also, I like working with small sections too, quick wins, but very useful. And another comment, thank you for the day four video. I've been doing this quietly for 27 years as a classroom teacher, and then in the last 1.5 years as a piano teacher, Never really knew if what I was doing was okay, but thank you to Tim and Top Music for giving me the confidence. Teaching students some of the famous and popular tunes and riffs they like speaks right to their need for autonomy. And I'll come back to these briefly after today's session. All right, let's kick it off. Here we go. I was watching uh, Rick Beato. Does anyone watch Rick Beato's YouTube channel? He's this incredible musician uh, who unpacks, you know, why is this song cool? And he does lots of different things. Anyway, he was interviewing and playing through the coolest 90s riffs of their childhood or something with this mate of his. And I just want you to listen to what he says right at the start here because that's exactly what I was just saying about pop riffs and hooks. Coming in at 17 is a song that when I was in high school, if you could play this intro on keyboard, you were a monster. Same with me in preschool. He could play at preschool. Here's number 17. I just, I just think it's cool because even he was known as the cool kid because he could play this particular uh, tune. And, and I was a pretty cool kid at school. I imagine even some of you watching were known as that piano girl or boy who can just play just about anything. And it's so, so important. So first question, what songs do you teach? Well, you teach whatever songs your student wants to learn. And that's why I don't really dictate because you can't keep current. And even a couple of the things I'm going to demonstrate today are probably not ones your students will want to learn today because they're from, um, you know, months and years past. And also kids don't always like all the same songs, of course. 
So you've kind of got two approaches here when it comes to teaching hooks and riffs and pop songs. On the left-hand side, I've got a student-led approach, and on the right hand, a more teacher-led approach. So let's have a look at the student-led approach first. This is where you can just ask them, what would you like to play? I'd like to set aside five minutes of each lesson with you, Billy, to go through a song that you really want to learn. Asking them what they're actually learning themselves, because nine times out of ten, most Music students will be on YouTube learning their own tutorials, whether you like it or not. So go with the flow, find out what they are learning and see if you can help them. It's an incredible rapport builder. And if they don't really come up with anything there, then just ask what's on your playlist. Show me your, if you're okay with it, show me your Spotify playlist or your recent YouTubes or whatever it is. Now, of course, you may find there's a small number of students who don't listen to any music or they only listen to classical or whatever it is. But for the most part, students will be able to find one of a song that they would like to learn or that they're already teaching themselves. So that's one approach you can use. The approach on the right-hand side is more the teacher-led approach where you, knowing how important learning about chords and some pop songs can be for students, you actually take the initiative to go, you know what, I'm going to teach you a few things that I really think you should learn. For example, how to play Happy Birthday, how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, how to play any of the top 10 pop songs that I've got on that um, download I created. If you haven't downloaded that, then feel free to grab it. It's about a 12-page download with top 10 great pop songs that you can teach with the notation and the chord symbols and the lyrics. And it's over at topmusic.co slash pop. And then, of course, as I, as I just mentioned, some famous hooks. If you played that Coldplay to just about any kid today, uh, they'll recognize it and they would want to learn it if they don't already know how to. And you can teach these things really simply by rote. Uh, here's another one that a lot of kids know. <laughs> We all know that one, right? Any kid that can sit down and play the Simpsons theme, oh, they're amazing in the eyes of their, their peers. So here's an annoying little ditty, that the hook that we all had to teach at one stage. If you had to teach Baby Shark to one of your students, put a yes in the comments now, wherever you are. This, at the time I took this screenshot, which was probably a year ago now, 2.5 billion views on YouTube. Like, just amazing, right? So the melody was just super boring and simple. Let me put my keyboard on. Now, if you saw that rhythm in notation, you'd probably freak out a little. It's not that easy to play. Bum, 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 bum. But we don't need to worry about notation for something like this. Students who know and love a pop song and want to play it will know the song pretty well by ear. The bit that you can teach them is what's on the screen now, and that's the chords that could go underneath it. So for this song, we've got G chord, C chord, E minor, and D major. And it goes like this. And there is a great little learning exercise for a student that's interested in learning Baby Shark. Now, I'm not about to tell you to go and learn Baby Shark. Sarah, you, you actually use this as a threat. Tell me, tell us quickly about that. <laughs> well, I had a student who decided to play Jingle Bells uh, in September this year. So it was 7 a.m. and her mom texted me because we're friends and she's like, she's playing Jingle Bells. And I was like, at least it's not Baby Shark. So that's kind of the thing with parents is if they get annoyed, I'm like, it's not Baby Shark. <laughs> that's right poor baby shark here's one i did more recently uh, again this is already fading out of popularity and this was a sea shanty that became popular on tiktok and it was kind of one of these and it was great fun i recorded a youtube video about it if uh, any of your students have said oh really there's something about sea shanties going on my son asked me what a sea shanty even was he still didn't understand it when i when i told him if you want to find out about that head over to my youtube channel you can watch the video of me teaching that but again just another example of picking up with a thread that a student wants to learn now on the top of your worksheet there's two fill in the gaps so I'm going to give you two very, very clear instructions right now. Before you start on this journey, when a student says they want to learn a song, 
stop and ask them which part they want to learn because it may well not be the beginning. In fact, it may be just one instrument playing the trumpet near the end. Like it, it's just, it could be just one little bit. And I think there's an important other factor to mention here, and that's that it's okay when you're using this more creative, flexible, modern approach to teaching that you don't have students finish all their songs. I was talking about this, funnily enough, with Will Bailey, who I mentioned I was interviewing for the podcast. It's okay that they're not going to perform this at a recital from start to finish and everyone applauding. It's okay if they just learn a few bars of some of these pieces. We don't want them to only do that. We'd love them to still have that satisfaction of learning one piece all the way through and performing it in front of people, but it doesn't have to be the case for everything they do. So that's one little other thing I would say. The other one is always ask what bit do you want to learn and then big stop sign, don't arrange the music yourself. Well, don't take it away and arrange it yourself and bring back a nice, easy version for them to play. And the reason is it wastes your own time and we don't have time to waste. Unless you particularly love doing arrangements, by the way. If you really love it, then go for it. But the thing that the student misses, even if you do enjoy it, is they miss out on learning how you went about simplifying it. And that's a much better skill for them to learn in, in a lesson. So let's take one example. Um, Sarah, just, just chime in if you see any um, questions coming up too. I had a student um, when The Martian came out, it was, a, it was a year or more ago, probably actually probably three years ago now, uh, wanted to play Starman by David Bowie. Here's, oh, and by the way, I just wanted to mention too, we have inside our Top Music Pro membership, for those of you who aren't members, we've got two incredible discounts. And this is one of the reasons we're able to give away these giveaways on the challenge. And that's because we've got a great relationship with both Music Notes and Sheet Music Plus that our members get 20% off Music Notes every single purchase they make. And the same at Sheet Music Plus, 10% off every single purchase. So if you're spending any kind of money over there, then you can save a lot of it by being a Top Music Pro member. You can even save more because if you join Music Notes Pro program, you get an extra 10% off and that can be added to this voucher. It's an insane deal. So make sure you do consider uh, joining us. We're going to talk a little bit more about Top Music Pro membership uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that now because these are two of the sites that most people go to when pop music comes up. I have a question and I'll give it to you because you'll probably get to it through this part. Yeah. Heidi says, what if the song they want to play is way above their level and they really want to learn the whole thing and they're not good enough to just learn, a, oh, it's not good enough for them to just learn part of it. So she's asking um, if the song is way above their level and they want to learn the whole thing. So I'm curious on your thoughts there. Yeah, great question um, from Heidi. If they want to learn the whole thing and it's too hard, then you've got to simplify it in some way. Uh, and I'm going to show you a few tricks now. And um, Sarah's going to demonstrate this with another song as well about how you can look to simplify things. And on the pop algorithm too, we talk about, different accompaniment styles and playing styles down the bottom. There's kind of four outcomes. So I'll get to that in just one sec, um, but it's a, a great question. I'll finish this and then I'll answer, I'll answer that a bit more. So here's the start of Starman and it sounds a bit like this. So I got all excited with my student and went, oh, isn't that cool? Is this the piece you wanted to learn? And he's like, what? That doesn't... <laughs> What is that? That doesn't sound anything like the bit I want to learn. So that was where this kind of stop sign idea came in because he didn't want to learn that bit. The bit he wanted to learn was this bit where it went um, the melody. which is the melody that we all know. And of course, that's the bit that he wanted to learn. So there's an example of find out which bit they want to learn. Now, we've now got a problem because he wasn't a very strong note reader. And have a look at the rhythm. I know it's a little bit small, hopefully not too fuzzy. The rhythm of the first two bars, sorry, the second and third bars of the top line. I don't even know if I'm playing it right. I'd actually have to work it out. Boring, too hard. So for something like that, that's an example of, okay, just listen to it. How does it sound? Okay, here's the notes. It's just an A repeated, and there's a chord in the left hand. We can talk to them about the chord. He didn't actually want to learn that bit either. That was just an aside. The bit that he wanted to learn was the melody bit. So we had a look at the music on music notes, and 
What we did with him is we talked through two different options. If you want to do a pop accompaniment style, that's where you would play the chords and someone would sing. So either your student would sing, uh, there's a man waiting in the sky, da, 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 um, turning it into a sea shanty. So you can just play the chords. You don't need to worry about the melody. So that's the style that you can play, this kind of... Just right-hand chord, keeping a beat, left-hand bass line. In the case of this student, he wasn't a very good singer, so he wanted to play the melody. So what we did is we took that right-hand part, the melody, I should say, and played it in the right hand. I didn't worry too much about reading the rhythm exactly because pop music is, you know, the notation is always a challenge, so just don't get hung up about it too much. But I did get him to read the notes so he could work out where it was and he used his ear too. And then the left hand, I just got him to play those chords above. So the F chord and then the D minor chord, the A minor, the C with a G. Now, if you're playing this in one hand, you would probably use a C second inversion because it has the G on the bottom. And I think the next chord's an F. So he was able to play... And blew his mind. Just the most amazing thing because he so wanted to do this. So that's one approach. And if you have a look at that flow chart now, what this is, is we've kind of gone down the left-hand side. We do want to teach with the printed score. Is it too hard to play as written? I'm actually going to update this because I think there's another uh, element to this where if you see on the left-hand side, it says, is it too hard to play as written? In fact, I can probably put it under this camera here. I think there's another step here. Can you simplify it? And if you can, then you can move down to the next box. Would your student like to sing? And that will determine which style in, that you play at the bottom. Now, what Sarah's going to do, she's got another example now of what something that she taught her student. This time, instead of using the notation, using the lyric chart. So over to you, Sarah. That's awesome. And one more thing I was going to say in regards to Heidi's question, because um, Tim, I love the way you work that all out with your student. Um, some of my students, I've had them just play the bass note with, mm -hmm. if they can't do the chords. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yep. Just like we talked about two days ago, just using first and thirds or root and fifth or bass notes as they get started. Absolutely. Yeah. So ho hopefully you can simplify it to a point for your student. Um, so I was super excited to share about this because I did a whole unit with my students on using one of the creativity Kickstarters from the Top Music Pro membership. So once a month, these are released and it looks a lot like our handouts that we have. So looking at the second sheet for your day four, that's what we're gonna look at for now. Um, I did a, pretty much a unit with almost all of my students where we learned the first chord progression of the most common chord progressions, the pop progressions from the creativity Kickstarter resource. So it was awesome. It was like already ready to go. Everyone got to go through it. So the chord progression that it shows on the sheet is a one, five, six, four. It's kind of growly down there. And there's lots and lots and lots of pop songs that use that progression. So it was really handy to teach everyone that and then have them choose from a list of songs that uses that chord progression. So they already know the chords in that order. So I did that with my student, Nancy. And she learned the, the progression in C and she was working on other pieces. So that took about a week or so. She just sort of reviewed that. And then she chose um, Photograph by Ed Sheeran for her project piece. And um, I, of course, asked the question, which part do you want to learn? And I, I usually just assume it's the chorus because that's the catchy part. But she wanted to start with the pre-chorus. And so this uses the same progression, but it just begins on the minor and begins on the six. So we have... Um, right you probably know this too so she already knew the chord progression so we went to the ultimateguitar.com and pulled up the chord lyric sheet and we both looked at this and she goes mm, can I keep it in C major and I was like sure but you've got to type up the lyrics yourself she's like okay so she types up the lyrics and she starts making her own chord sheet 
And then she got a blank piece of staff paper with her treble clef so that she could write out the, the, the melody. Um, so she had her two sheets kind of together that we would work through in the lesson. And then during the week, she would make up her own lean sheet and make it look pretty and, and all that. So she decided that she did not want to sing, even though she could have just sort of done chords in the right hand and bass in the left. And so she came back after the first week and here's how it sounded. And I want to know from you what you think. She was, and I said, oh, you should just put that up an octave. It sounds too growly down there. And she was like, no, it needs to stay in that octave because that's how it sounds correct. So we came up with a compromise that every chord below C3, everything below this would be just an open fifth. And then, you know, um, so we, we agreed on that one. <laughs> and then the fun part was, um, you know, like Nancy's a fabulous adult student of mine. Her performance fluency is a little rocky sometimes, and her ear's never been very strong. Um, but we work on lots of things that she enjoys, and it's cool. But this was a cool opportunity for us to look at the pentatonic scale in the melody. And um, at first, she seemed pretty, like, hesitant to work it out a bit with me. And so I gave her some guidance at the beginning. And then she, once she realized, oh, they're using the exact same, like it's a, a parallel period phrase. But once she realized that, she's like, oh. And then when we moved on to the chorus, she had so much more confidence and was able to work through that, knowing that she was going to use choices from most of the pentatonic scale and the way the melody was organized. So she got all these pedagogical veggies that she didn't know about, where her harmonic understanding was a lot deeper. She, she was even surprised at how slow the harmonic rhythm was. She's like, really? I hold this chord for four beats? And I was like, yeah, there's lots of syllables in there. So she got the harmonic rhythm understanding and, and how repetitive um, some of the patterns were. She was surprised and she's like, but it still sounds so great. I was like, yeah. Um, and her performance fluency has just soared in the last couple of weeks because I guess because she's excited. I'm not really sure or that she listens to it a lot. So she knows how it's supposed to go, but um, it's really, really helped with that. And then, of course, her ear training skills have really improved, too, to the point where I didn't have to give her a guiding note anymore as we got toward um, the second section when she did the chorus. And then her note reading, she's working on that during the week when she's writing out the notes. So it was, it's been a pretty great project for her. Um, and then I wanted to show the chorus, if you want to click over the next slide. Mm -hmm. We have the same, same chord progression, but we start on the, the one chord this time. with like a pretty basic arrangement she could have you know eventually done a little bit more um patterns and so on but this is what fits for her right now so hopefully that helps if you've got a student and maybe just looking at the written score sometimes when we simplify from the written score it confuses them visually especially if they have some reading difficulties so mm, absolutely yeah that's great sarah thanks for those um other examples so those uh the uh, example Sarah gave, I think, flows down to the bottom of the algorithm chart in the play chord slash lyric chart accompaniment style or the solo style because Sarah's student was keen to play the melody uh, as well. So have a look through this tonight or at some stage uh, and see, see what you think. As I say, I reckon there's one more box I could add to this. I, I like improving things as I go. The right-hand side um, is all about... Uh, playing by ear, the, you know, if, if the student has some pretty good oral skills and or if you would like to work with them on those and you have the time to, then that can be a great option as well. So you've got hopefully a good idea of some approaches you can use. Now, before we wrap up today's session, I've got one example and I want some comments in the chat boxes. Here is a piece I think you'll probably recognize. Let's say your student really wanted to learn this, just these first two lines of this, and they were, you know, they've been learning for maybe two or three months, so they can kind of form a chord, they can kind of play, but the reading of this would be way outside their level of ability. So what are some things you could do to this piece? Just chuck a few ideas in the chat quickly to simplify it 
with the student in front of you to show them how they could how they could play this. Are there elements you might teach by rote? Would you try and do the rhythm as written? Would you try and count it out? <laughs> Would you count it out? One eender, two eender, and all that stuff. Sabrina says broken chords. Uh, Kara says she'd teach the chords and then play the right hand by rote, yes, or the right hand by ear. So you could uh, play the left hand and then chord. Yep, totally. Heidi says transpose to C and use chords. Ah, cool. Yes, you, you definitely could do that. There's only there's one downside of transposing, of course, and that's that it won't you won't be able to play along with the original if that's something the student would like to do. But oftentimes it's not that important. Uh, I've taught a few times this piece. <laughs> I don't know whether that is coming through too well. The uh, Moonlight Sonata in E minor, because there's this great easy version in E minor. And suddenly it becomes really um, playable for even beginners. So I think, yes, yeah, changing the keys, totally fine, totally fine. So here's, whoa, here's what I thought. Could definitely change the key. If you wanted to teach the right, the first, the intro by rote, because this... It's actually quite fun to play and it's really famous that the you know, people who know Elton would know that instantly. So you could just take out the top note of those left hand chords and just play the roots and fifths or sixths. Uh, and then yes, I've circled the chords. I'd take out the major seventh for the A flat, that second chord, just play A flat, keep it simple. And then right hand, play as they know how it sounds. If they want to play this, chances are they'll know how it sounds and be able to play it in time anyway. Well done, everyone. That's fantastic. I think you've got the idea down beautifully. I will stop my share and bring us back to the group. So we have a task for you, as always, to try and cement this knowledge. Some of you will have done this before. Some of you will. This, this may well be really new. So what have we got, Sarah? What's our challenge for tonight? Do you want to spotlight me, baby? Yes. Let me do so, that. So for your hook, line, and sinker homework, you get to choose your own catchy part. You have the control this time. Choose the part that you want to play. Um, or you can play one from the examples that we did today. So think about something that you would love to share. Um, that's one thing my students love when their, their family is like, oh, they, everyone recognized it, right? So think about something you want your family or your students to recognize to show off. Pick a showy something and um, post the title of the song you rocked out to. And as always, a selfie or a video are so welcome. We love hearing them. I'm already pumped to hear these all. Yeah. So learn a hook. Share it yeah. with us. Learn a hook and share it. Uh, it could be, uh, if you like musical theatre, it could be something from The Greatest Showman or uh, Hamilton or it could be a pop song or a Beatles song or, yeah, anything really. But let's aim for something pop pop in the pop genre or the modern genre, so uh, not an entertainer-style thing or a, even, even this. <laughs> I mean, that's a bit of a hook in its own right for kids to be able to show that off because people know it from advertising and things. Um, but we'll, we'll steer, steer clear of the classical for this um, activity. Love to know if there's any questions before we wrap things up with the Facebook Live group. Um, while we wait for our final questions, we'll just go through what's happening tomorrow as well. So coming up tomorrow, it's our last day, Sarah. It's a bit sad. Really? I really enjoyed this. It's just been so much fun. Uh, and I've just, as we said at the start, we've been so proud of everyone just getting involved, posting things, asking questions. It makes it really fun for us to deliver this content too. So we're covering kind of two areas tomorrow, Sarah, in our wrap up. What, um, how would you explain it? Uh, well, we're doing connections through chords. So we're looking at chord progressions that are present in classical rep and connecting them to um, popular rep also so that students can really see the skeleton of the chord progression and see how like what's old is new again and so that they can connect those things together and that also so that they can build on their analytic skills so they get more excited about you know taking a look at that sonatina and analyzing it and being able to play just the chords which is huge for memorization and other goals that you likely have mm. 
it's a great way to be able to pull together the knowledge that you might be learning in the pop song creative side of your lessons to the music that they're learning. Uh, so like yesterday with our repertoire remixing, I love finding ways to connect the creativity with the pedagogy and the music you're already teaching. And tomorrow we go into a little bit more about that. So it's about taking your uh, Clementi Sonatina and work, breaking it down. What is the chord progression underlying this with your student and, and helping them learn about that? I, I have to say that as a performer, I'm a really, well, I'm not a very good performer, <laughs> full stop, but I'm a pretty, I'm a really bad memorizer. My memory is terrible. It comes so naturally to some people. But one thing I can always fall back on if I have a memory slip is my ability to improvise. And I tell you what, I've improvised out of so many memory slips in performances before just because I know what key we're working in and I know the style and I can kind of just make it up while I go back to where I last knew where I was kind of thing. I'd love for students to be able to do that. It's what, I mean, what a skill to be able to, to give them. And just that ability to sit down at an instrument and play, play, play something without any music. Uh, you know, it's just one of the big joys of being a pianist, I think. Absolutely. All right. Great. Well, I can't see any questions in Facebook, so we might say goodbye to our Facebook crowd now and we'll continue with our VIPs. So stay where you are, VIPs, in Zoom. We're going to say goodbye to Facebook. See you later, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Same time, same place for our last session. So before today's session, I mentioned students' need for autonomy, and this is part of something called self-determination theory that states that people are motivated to grow and change by three innate and universal psychological needs. And one of them is to be self-determined, i.e. self-motivated, and three innate and universal psychological needs. This theory suggests that people are able to become self-determined, i.e. self-motivated, when their needs for competence, connection, and relevance and autonomy are fulfilled. And giving students autonomy within the bounds of your teaching approach is really important, even for younger children. If it's just, would you like to learn this or that? Or more open, what's a piece you've heard on piano that you'd like to play? For teens and adults in particular, we really must be guided by the goals and aspirations of the student. So this, I hope, has been a really helpful and eye-opening for some of you experience about how you can approach this idea of hooks and themes and ideas and helping students to play some of the things that they really want to play. So here are some of the results from our original cohort that took this challenge uh, and let's explore those now. So Leanna said, I love using this approach with my students. The hardest part I find is finding out what songs they actually like as I mostly have young students at the moment. It goes something like this, me. So what songs do you like to listen to, student? I don't know, me. So if I let you look up something on YouTube right now, what would you be listening to? Student, I don't know. Fortunately, they all seem to like the same ones. So what works for one student generally works for others too. And that's still true today. I don't have any lessons until tomorrow, but I'll try to post below a student playing Count On Me by Bruno Mars. And here it is. Let's hear from Linda as well. She said, I just want to share an example of one of my teen students performing a song that he learned using this day four style of teaching. Blake is a beginner and I asked him if there was a pop song he'd like to learn. Surprising to me, he chose Cindy Lauper's Time After Time. He actually made it way more simple than I would have and I love it. Have a listen to this. Hello, my name is Blake Killian and I'm going to be performing Time After Time by Cindy Lauper. Circles, confusion is nothing new. Flashback, words almost left behind. Suitcase of memories, time after song.
Well, I hope you enjoyed today's day four of the Hero Challenge. Next week, we're going to be unlocking full Top Music Pro studio access for the discounted price of $19. Tune in next week to find out more and we'll also be covering a real summary concept here as a way of wrapping up the challenge when we talk about finding connections through chords. I really hope you've been enjoying this series. I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to the Topcast from Top Music Co. I'll speak to you again next week. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.